It is now time for a question period. The member from uh, Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, your budget bill comes up for a third reading. But, Premier, there is a giant loophole, one that you had a chance to close yesterday at committee but chose not to. The Trillium Trust Act, which uh, will put proceeds from government asset sales first into general revenues, not directly into the trust. There's no guarantee that any money will ever make it to the trust and not be used just to offset your deficit. Uh, once you sell an asset, only you, without this legislature ever knowing, gets to decide whether that money is, quote, qualified to go into the trust, and if so, how much will actually ever make it into the trust. We brought amendments that would increase the transparency uh, and reporting of asset sales. Premier, why did your government vote against the amendments for openness and transparency? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Finance is going to want to talk about the technicalities of the Trillium Trust, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me just say this: that we are committed and have been from the time uh, from the time that uh, we introduced the plan, and in fact, before, Mr. Speaker, we have been committed to building transportation infrastructure, including transit, and we have committed to creating trust funds, Mr. Speaker, so that, so that pe the people of Ontario will know how much money is going into uh, transit and transportation infrastructure building, Mr. Speaker, and how that money is being spent. We've committed $29 billion, $15 billion for the uh, Greater Toronto Hamilton area, $14 billion for outside of the uh, Greater Toronto Hamilton area, Mr. Answer. Speaker. And I am uh, I'm pleased that the member opposite is showing an interest in uh, building transit, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. I hope that means that maybe he'll support the budget. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, sadly, Premier, your handling of the gas plant money gives us one billion reasons not to trust, not to take your word for it. So let's run through this again. First, you sell an asset, but only you decide, with criteria unknown to anybody else, whether that asset is, quote, qualified to go into the trust. Then, according to the Act, you may require, not must require, a portion of the proceeds, not all of the proceeds, to go into the trust. There's nothing to stop you from simply diverting that money into reducing your deficit, and we'll never know about it. That's why we asked for an amendment that has the Auditor General identify how the money from the sale of assets is distributed. Question. Premier, why did you instruct your committee to vote against our transparency? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Finance. Yes. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's pretty rich to hear a member from the opposition talk about transparency, yeah. especially when they sold the 407 for pennies, Mr. Speaker, without any revelation. In our budget, we have a chapter dedicated to transparency and accountability, and we'll continue to do exactly what's necessary to advise the public of what it is that we're doing. We've already stated that any sale of assets— Stop the clock, please. Too much noise on all sides. Please finish. <laughs> Glenn Gary, Prescott Russell, come to order. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to provide that openness and transparency in the work that we do. We have made it clear that whatever is being reviewed and assessed Mr. will Speaker, be made public. And we've already dedicated, and we've said that we'll dedicate all those to the Trillium Trust to be used specifically Answer. for transportation and infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do what's in the best interest of the public Thank and you. of the people Final of Ontario. Supplement. Thank you, uh, Premier. Yesterday, your members voted against the open and transparent sale of those very assets. Look, let's be clear. We're not against the sale of assets, but we're against using one-time money to pay for your operating expenses. Yesterday, the Liberals told the committee that bringing in the Auditor General was redundant. This is the same Auditor General's office that discovered and revealed to this legislature the Liberals' abuse of another file, the debt retirement charge. We learned that back in 2004, four billion more dollars was added to the debt without being disclosed until 2012, a full eight years later, and we're still paying for that today. 
That money went Minister straight into general order. revenue to artificially lower your deficit. Question. Is that what you're going to do with the Trillium Trust Fund? Is that why you voted against transparency? Mr. Speaker, the debt retirement charge was a product of that of that party. They left us a legacy of billions and billions of dollars because of a of a an electricity scheme that went awry that the public has had to pay for. Stop the clock. I've said it a second time now, and that is the noise is coming from all sides while the answer is being given and the question being put. I will now move to warnings. Direct. And then after that, it's naming. Please finish. So, Mr. Speaker, as a result of the, those mistakes, the very issues that the member is speaking about that we have made corrections and that we're continuing to do, we have put in place in this budget mem uh, uh, accountability measures. We're being more transparent. Each of these situations have different circumstances by, which, by each transaction. There are different types of assets that are involved. There are different types of accounting treatments. So we will disclose and indicate exactly what we're doing. And the member opposite and his party did not do that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we are the yes, ones sir. that impose those transparency measures. We're the ones that are being held accountable. And C.D. Howe Institute and others Thank have you. indicated the integrity. See the police. New question, the member from the Freedom Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. With troublesome economic indicators on the horizon, such as a negative outlook by credit rating agencies and upcoming labour negotiations, under the cloud of a $12 billion deficit, could the Premier tell us which is her priority, avoiding labour strikes at all costs or meeting her deficit reduction targets? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, the reality of governing is that uh, there are complexities that mean that it's not either or, Mr. Doesn't Speaker. You don't choose Speaker. between making sure that uh, that we have ex an excellent education system, that we have uh, good working partnerships with uh, the people who are in our schools, the teachers, the support staff, the administrators, with the school boards, Mr. Speaker. We don't choose between that and making sure that we uh, that we meet our fiscal targets. We have to do both, Mr. Yep. Speaker, and our plan lays out our uh, path to do exactly that, to do both of those things and to do them in a balanced way, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I lack the uh, Premier's confidence in her balancing skills. It's clear that with the Metrolink's 8.5% wage hike precedent, that further negotiations with teachers and doctors this fall will be hampered, like uh, probably compromise, similar to a Frito-Lay commercial. If I give one to you, I have to give one to everyone else. It's clear that they can't meet their spending Minister targets Municipal while increasing affairs and housing is compensation. They like to talk about net zeros over there, but I ask the Premier, what does net zero compensation actually mean to her? Is it higher pay with fewer workers? Is it higher pay with fewer benefits? Is it higher pay with less services? Or will the Premier just admit it really is just a higher pay that Ontarians are going to have to pay for because it will mean a higher deficit with no real clear spending priorities or reductions priorities in place? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, there, there are some fundamental differences that underlie uh, the, the question that uh, the leader of the, uh, the leader, the um, <laughs> member of the opposition. Oh, leader of one of you. <laughs> Who knows? Um, that the member opposite uh, is asking, Mr. Speaker. And one of those fundamental differences between us and them is this. We believe in the collective bargaining process. We believe that it should be respected, Mr. Speaker, and we believe that it is the best way for the, uh, the agreements to be put in place, Mr. Speaker, so that collective bar bargaining process will be honoured by us. Having said that, we have been very clear that there is no new money for uh, those settlements. There's no new money for benefits, for Answer. Uh, well, uh, salaries or wages, Mr. Speaker. And so those collective bargaining processes will take place within the funding that is in place, as Thank they you. did in the Metrolink situation, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. 
what the Premier fails to mention is that there are always consequences to these higher pay increases. So if the government, through Metrolinx, can give an 8.5% wage hike to workers while talking about, quote, zero, net zeros, it means either raising fees on riders or cutting from somewhere else in their budget, possibly from other services, or, finally, that the deficit will increase. Similarity, similarly, with teacher contract negotiations due this fall, a 2% increase for elementary teachers will either come with a cut elsewhere in education, bigger class sizes and or fewer teachers, or again, the deficit will increase. Given the Liberal priority is waving the white flag on wage freezes, will the Premier admit she is not interested in all in meeting her deficit reduction targets and Ontarians are going to pay, pay higher taxes as a result of it? Mr. Speaker, well, that's just Premier. not true. I am very interested in meeting our deficit targets, Mr. Yep. Speaker, and we will do that. And, you know, the priority of the party opposite is to enter into conflict with organized labour. That is a, a starting point for them. That's a fundamental belief that that is a good way to govern. We saw it when they were in office uh, previous to 2003. We saw it during their, uh, their campaign that they believe that having disruptive, conflicted relationships with the people who deliver health care and education and the services that people need in this province, that they believe that that is the way to go. Well, we don't believe that, Mr. Speaker. We believe that transforming systems, the work that has been done in health Healthcare, Mr. Sis Mr. Speaker, to uh, provide for better and different delivery of service. That is the focus of our government, Mr. Speaker. Those kinds of transformations, as well as continuing to have good working relationships with the people who deliver those Thank essential you. services in Ontario. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, for weeks, the Premier has refused to answer questions about uh, asset sales, her asset sales, and her cuts to public services. So far, the Premier has also refused uh, to allow an independent review of her fiscal plan, the very same ind independent review that she supported in 2004 and since. Speaker. She's choosing to ignore the fact that only in election years can the auditor review the government's estimates, assumptions, and projections and report to the public on whether the fiscal plan is reasonable or whether it is not. Will the Premier tell us why she believes every election budget needs independent oversight except her own? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've answered every one of the questions that the leader of the third party has put to me, and I will say again, Mr. Speaker, that we were on track to have that review of our budget, Mr. Speaker. The NDP in particular decided that they did not support the budget, Mr. Speaker, and plunged us into an election, Mr. Speaker. That was the choice of the third party and the opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, we went into an election. We brought the plan that we had introduced at the beginning of May in our budget, Mr. Speaker. We have reintroduced that budget, and the Auditor General, as we speak, is looking at uh, the finances of this province, and her, ta her report will be tabled in the fall. Speaker. Stop the clock. Um, I will make mention of this only once as a sidebar to my other comment about warning somebody. The debate that goes on at the back between questions will stop. If it doesn't, you'll be warned. You can point your finger all you want, you'll be included. And I advise the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek to pay attention this way and not to the person inv invoking you. Next question, please. Speaker, the Premier is remarkably adamant she will stand in the way of fiscal transparency and actually prevent an independent review of the fiscal plan by the Auditor General. Now that she's in charge, she sees no need for a public report by the Auditor on this year's election budget. If the Premier won't allow a public review, Speaker, will she at least tell the House whether the Auditor General has been privately consulted about any of the details in her fiscal plan? Thank you, Premier. Well, for the public no, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is remarkably adamant and was remarkably adamant that she was going to stand in the way of a budget 
budget that would put money into eliminating wait lists for developmental services, uh, would put more money into the hands of personal support workers, would put more money into the hands of municipalities for housing, Mr. Speaker. What I'm adamant about is that we do all of those things, that we actually make those investments that are necessary, Mr. Speaker, including in transit and transportation, which the leader of the third party has also been adamant that she will stand in the way of. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our plan is, has been laid out uh, for the people of Ontario. We were on schedule to have a pre-election audit, Mr. Speaker. The opposition and the third party decided that we would have an election. The Auditor General is writing her report. And Mr. Speaker, our plan is Answer. open and clear for everyone in the province to see, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. Final supplementary. Speaker, families have a right to know whether their government is making prudent and reasonable assumptions about the province's future state of affairs. That is pretty basic stuff. That's pretty basic when it comes to transparency and accountability. They have a right to know, Speaker, because the services that they rely on are at stake. Services like public transit, Speaker. Will the Premier confirm that the Ministry of Finance is working with the Auditor General to address concerns surrounding the treatment of gas tax revenues for transit? Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, the all of our ministries work with the Auditor General as, yeah. uh, as she makes inquiries and, uh, and asks questions, Mr. Speaker, and the Ministry of Finance is, uh, is absolutely no exception. The, the fiscal plan that we put forward is the fiscal plan that the NDP ran on, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It was the foundation of their platform. Yeah. What I believe is happening right now is that the leader of the third party is looking for any reason she can find, and she's grasping at any straw to justify why she will not support a budget that will put more money into the hands of pe the people who are most, most vulnerable in this, in this province. She is looking for a reason not to vote for the budget that will put money into the hands of personal support workers who are among our lowest paid workers and are our most valued in Answer. terms of transformation of the health care system. She's looking for an excuse not to support a budget that will put $810 million into developmental services. Mr. Thank you. New questions? Leader of the third party. Speaker, my uh, next question is also for the Premier. Uh, the need for an independent review by the auditor is becoming more and more clear every time the Premier tries to brush off our concerns. Speaker. If there are any discussions going on uh, between this government and the auditor about the numbers and how those numbers shape up, it is the responsibility of the Premier to be open and frank with the public. I remember this Premier used to talk about that all the time. Speaker. It seems that she forgot that that was one of her fundamental beliefs in the past. Will the Premier inform this House Speaker whether the Auditor General has contacted or been contacted by the Ministry of Finance concerning the accounting methods being used for transit funding? And if so, when will the public be told about the Auditor's concerns, Speaker? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the just, just to the to the uh, question on the gas tax. You know, the gas tax, uh, the two two cents in the gas tax that is dedicated to transit across the province is about it's about 320 million dollars a year, wow. Mr. Speaker. That is dedicated Maybe funding that goes to municipalities budget. according to ridership and population, Mr. Speaker. That formula has been in place for a number of years and it remains in place. So actually, I don't I don't understand the uh, the concern on the part of the leader of the third party about this because we are are committed to keeping that uh, that gas tax funding in place but you know if she is so concerned about our fiscal plan she maybe should go back and reread page two of her own platform and what that said was and I quote we will balance Ontario's books by 2017-18 with significantly more fiscal space than the Liberal plan Answer. mr. speaker and then it goes on to say our plan will provide an additional fiscal cushion of over 700 million annually so mr. speaker they based their plan on our plan, and then they went Thank further. You. They said they would find more. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, every time the Premier refuses to answer straightforward questions, she raises even more doubts about the prudence of the assumptions behind her austerity budget. And that is the bottom line. Because if the actual budget, Speaker, truly reflects, reflects the story that the government tells, then the Premier should be welcoming the auditor's oversight with open arms. It begs the question, Speaker, what reason could possibly be there to explain why the premier determined to is so determined rather to avoid public review of the numbers behind her fiscal plan Premier. Mr. Speaker, I welcome, I do welcome the Auditor General's questions. I welcome her scrutiny at any point in any one of our ministries, Mr. Speaker. I believe that the Auditor General's work is extremely important to the functioning of, of government and the improvement of government and its delivery of services. So I welcome the scrutiny of the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker. You know, the fact is that the Standard & Poor's just this week, Mr. Speaker, has said that Ontario's financial management is strong in our view. The level of transparency and disclosure in its financial statements is high. Notes and schedule pr provide detailed information about core government agencies and boards and business enterprises. The Independent Auditor General audits the province's financial statements. That's an ongoing process, Mr. Speaker. Her report, the Auditor yes, General's sir. report, will be tabled in the fall. And as I say, I welcome that scrutiny. Thank you. Speaker, yesterday the Premier said that she actually doesn't think that Dalton McGuinty's transparency and accountability measures are too good for her own government. That's a relief. But it also means that the Premier needs to stop dragging her heels on an independent review. The former Premier ensured his fiscal plans received independent oversight in election years, even in 2011, Speaker, when the auditor raised serious doubts about the government's assumptions. Will the Premier simply follow her mentor's lead and request an independent review of her fiscal plan by the Auditor General to be made public before the end of this year? Thank you, Premier, for the end of this year. Well, Mr. Speaker, the report of the Auditor General will be tabled in the fall, and the, the leader of the third party uh, made a comment earlier about what I used to or didn't used to talk about, and here's, Mr. Speaker, what the, uh, what the NDP used to talk about. Used to. The NDP used to talk about um, issues like poverty, so increasing the child benefit would have been something that they would have supported in the past, Mr. Speaker. They used to talk about the need for increases in social assistance benefits, so they would have supported a budget conceivably that included those increases, as our budget does, Mr. Speaker. They used to talk about the need for a systemic approach to dealing with developmental services, so they would have supported a budget that included $810 million for developmental services. They used to talk, just as recently as in the election campaign, they used to talk about the need for expansion of student nutrition programs, so you would have thought that they would have supported a budget that included $20 million for that expansion. The, the leader of the third party is looking for any reason not to support our Thank you. New question? The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, as you know, Orange Air Ambulance has been charged with 17 offences under the Canada Labour Code. These charges are as a result of the May 31, 2013 crash that claimed the lives of four dedicated Orange employees that occurred under your government's watch after appointing new leadership. Minister, the documents show that the pilot of the flight was, and I quote, without adequate training in the operation of that specific aircraft, and Orange failed to provide the pilots with, again a quote, a means to enable them to maintain visual reference while operating at night, even with repeated warnings dating back Back to September 2012. As a result, Orange is now being charged with failure to employ and ensure employee safety. Minister, there are still clearly systemic problems at Orange that your government has failed to correct. Question. What are you going to do to make sure that Orange employees and their patients are being traveling safely sure. on Orange aircraft? Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know the member opposite appreciates because there is a uh, process underway that uh, involves uh, the potential of uh, or 
real issue of uh, court uh, action uh, that it would be inappropriate for me to speak about those details, but I, I am happy and, in fact, I'm very proud to speak of the progress that's been made uh, by Orange over the past number of years uh, in a whole set of issues. And I want to give my commitment to the member opposite that we have been and we are and will continue to work on all, virtually all of the recommendations that have been put forward by the various entities in terms of continuing to improve the performance of, uh, of Orange. And we need to remember those hardworking individuals that uh, perform such a vital function every single day. So whether it's on issues like uh, concerning the governance of Orange, we've put steps into place for increasing government oversight. We have a very strong board yes, in place, sir. which has uh, made uh, exceptional progress over the last uh, number of years that I'm happy to speak to in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I would say, Minister, Mr. Speaker, I would say to the minister that this is a very serious issue. Four people have died, and now Orange is facing some very serious charges. So clearly, whatever changes you have made haven't worked. We need to make sure that these people are going to be kept safely. Despite opposition inquiries and a committee of an investigation into Orange, the previous Minister of Health insisted to this House on numerous occasions that everything was fine. In fact, on April 19, 2013, less than two months before the crash, the Minister stated that, quote, Orange is a much, much stronger organization now, new leadership, new protocols, and so on. However, these protocols clearly failed to protect Orange employees and their patients. Minister, major changes need to be made at Orange to make sure that no more lives are lost. In fact, even a few weeks ago, there was a potential incident involving a near miss near Ottawa. Minister, can Question. you tell us specifically what you are prepared to do to ensure that Orange employees and their patients are traveling safely? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Mr. Speaker, I was, as uh, all members of this legislature, were absolutely devastated to hear of that tragedy just over one year ago when two pilots and two paramedics uh, regrettably uh, uh, lost their lives in that tragic incident. And to this day, uh, our hearts, our thoughts go to the family and the friends and the colleagues of those of four individuals who unfortunately perished. And I, again, want to uh, um, to indicate to the member opposite, and I know this is an issue which is important to her as well, that we uh, take uh, the recommendations uh, before us very, very seriously. Uh, we take these charges very seriously as well, as does Orange and their leadership, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and I have to also point out that before this tragic incident, as well as subsequent to that, we have been working very closely with Transport Canada yes, on a number of measures to improve uh, not just patient safe, safety and the overall performance of Orange, but it particularly, as was demonstrated by this Thank case, you. to ensure the safety of uh, the workers at Orange. Here, here. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Yesterday, I introduced a private member's bill, the Greater Protection for Interns and Vulnerable Workers Act, that was first introduced by my former colleague Jonas Schein. I want to make it clear that this bill goes significantly beyond the rather weak measures included in your Bill 18. Uh, for example, one provision of my bill requires that employers notify the Minister of Labour when they bring in interns and clearly spell out expectations such as job description and hours of work. Speaker, there is no reason for the continued exploitation of unpaid interns in this province. So I ask the minister, will this government be supporting my bill? Thank you. Minister Labour. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise on this important issue, and I thank the member for her question. And let me be very, very, very clear right from the start. It doesn't matter what your job title is. It doesn't matter what your position is. If you perform work for somebody in the province of Ontario, you're covered by the Employment That's Standards right. Act and you deserve to be paid. Sure There's enough. a very narrow exemption for those people that are enrolled in educational institutions, co-op students or the self-employed or trainees. But certainly, if you're performing work for somebody in this province, you deserve to be paid. We have proactive enforcement on this issue. We've been out to a number of uh, employers. We've, be, we've, talked, we've talked to the post-secondary institutions, and we're making sure that people in the province of Ontario understand that we're very, very serious about this issue, that yes, we're going to continue the inspections, and that we're going to ensure, as I said from the start, you work in Ontario, you get paid Thank in you. Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, in response to the exemptions, I wanted to point out that another measure in my bill would bring co-op students, interns and other trainees who are currently exempted under the Employment Standards Act so that they would be entitled to some basic workplace protections. Too many workers are exempted from the Employment Standards Act, and this provision takes a small step to close those loopholes. My bill is supported by students and labour law experts. So I ask again, will this government support my bill and end the exploitation of unpaid interns in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Well, the bill will make its way through the House like every other private member's bill. But let me tell you, in the last term of government, before that party caused the election, Bill 146 was before this House, which, would, uh, which will extend coverage to co-op students. Bill. We've reintroduced that now as Bill 18. Terrific. So it's back on the books again, Speaker. I want to tell you, though, that on average, the Ministry of Labour receives just over 18,000 employment claims each year. We've got 150 Employment Standards office, Officers who are carrying out both proactive uh, inspections proactive. and they investigate claims on all types of violations, including internships. Good. I want to also tell the people out there that are watching on TV and the people that are in the chamber if they have a concern with, Answer. It, with internships, there's a hotline 1-800-531-5551. Call go. that Thank number, you. we'll investigate. Give it a call. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, the Select Committee on Developmental Services tabled its final report yesterday to the House. This committee's job is to tell us about the developmental services system and the coordination of supports for people in our province with developmental disabilities. I have met with many of these families in my riding of Kitchener Centre, and I can tell you that we were very pleased to learn that this committee was restruck and that the House has now received its very important recommendations. Mr. Speaker, there are many people who are very interested in hearing from the Minister on her views of the committee and its work. So, could she please share that with us? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for uh, that question to the member of uh, Kitchener Centre. And uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the excellent work by the members from all sides of this House on the Select Committee for Developmental Services. I think uh, it's very clear when we put partisan ideology aside and we work together in the public interest that we can come up with some very, very strong recommendations, and that's exactly what this committee has done. And also, of course, I'd like to thank all the people who made submissions, both in person and written submissions. Uh, they were very thoughtful, and uh, clearly uh, there is a sense of urgency in the community that we need to address the concerns. Now, many of the issues that were raised in the report were issues of which my ministry was very well aware. In fact, my predecessor, uh, the Honourable Answer. McMeekin, did put a lot of pieces in place to address these issues, right. including, of course, the $810 million over wow. the next year. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Well, it's very encouraging to hear that you and your officials welcome this report and that the recommendations are being considered. Now, in the budget, which was tabled last week, you mentioned this unprecedented infusion of $810 million for developmental services, and that by 2016-2017, these new funds are going to climb to over $2 billion for developmental services. Mr. Speaker, money alone is not enough to deal with the urgent needs and challenges that the developmentally disabled and their families have to deal with every day. Along with the funding, could the minister please inform this House of the actions that she is taking to continue the work of strengthening developmental services in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you again to the member for the question. And of course, as uh, she has explained, certainly the $810 million over three years is not uh, the whole story. Uh, investments are important, but our government understands that addressing the significant issues facing families are not just about more funding. And so that's why I'm very pleased to uh, announce that we will be convening a housing task force in the very near future to recommend innovating house innovative housing solutions for a broader set of residential options. 
options uh, for people with developmental disabilities. We're also ta talking with staff at Developmental Services Ontario about some of the practices that they have introduced that are particularly positive. I think it's worth recognizing that we do have some 18,000 adults receiving residential supports at this point in time Answer. here in Ontario, and there are more than 15,000 that receive direct funding through the passport program. So while we have serious issues, we also need to find Thank you. our best practices yeah, yeah. in this Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, fourth on this block. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Minister, Ontario used to be yours to discover, but that won't be the case for much longer with your government's decision to increase the province's aviation fuel tax by 148 per cent. The National Airlines Council of Canada projects this tax increase will drive away 400,000 more air travellers wow. and greatly impact hotels, restaurants, travel agents and tour operators, among others who support this industry. Minister, do you have any idea how many jobs that will cost those working in the tourism industry? The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think the member opposite also recognizes in order to promote tourism, economic growth, the vitality of our province, we must make those investments in infrastructure, exactly. investments in so. things that are make us competitive. They want to make certain that we have an air rail link from Union Station to the airport. They want to make certain that we eliminate gridlock, which is costing three, uh, six billion dollars annually. They want to make certain that when we attract tourism, they have the availability and the ability to see the province in all its glory. And in so doing, Mr. Speaker, we're raising aviation tax by one penny per litre. That is modest in comparison to the lion's share of taxes and services and fees that are being charged by the federal government. I would recommend the member opposite talk to Lisa Raitt and the federal government to reduce their taxes. Thank you, Minister. It's always Harper's fault. Always Harper's well, Minister, I guess the shuffle to Buffalo will just increase. Exactly. You know, in 2012, British Columbia, as part of its jobs plan and despite facing budget constraints, actually decided to eliminate its fuel tax on international flights to attract new services and create new jobs. And it has worked. They have 22 airlines adding new flights out of Vancouver while injecting millions into the BC economy. Each new daily international flight creates between 150 and 200 new jobs, and another 400 jobs are created in hotels, restaurants, and other businesses. The proof is in the numbers. Your government's proposed tax increase will threaten at least 3,000 jobs. Will you commit today to stop this leadless tax hike until you study the full implication that the job losses will have Western. for the tourism industry. Do that Great today, question. Minister. Do that. So, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, a comparison between uh, Ontario versus and the Ontario Airport, the major one being, of course, Pearson International Airport, compared to the other international airports around the world. And Ontario continues to be more competitive than they are. So we will continue to do so. And this hasn't changed since 1992, but when you look at the tax that we're talking about, 2.7 cents versus what's being paid Order. in London at 69 cents, Mr. Speaker, or Paris at 54 cents, New York at. Stop, please. The member from the PN Carleton is warned. Finish, please. We compare against Chicago and even other provinces like Manitoba. Ontario will still be more competitive than they are. But I again, the member opposite talks about balancing the budget, making certain that we take the necessary steps to increase our revenue where possible to invest in those things that matter. That's the balanced approach that we're taking. The member opposite should also be like, again talk to your federal cousins who are saying yes, to increase our revenues and take advantage of those things that we can to improve our bottom line. That's exactly what we're doing. I would, I would again, talk to Thank your you. cousins and get them to— Thank you. The member's taking a tightrope walk. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. Under the Education Act, the minister is required, quote, to ensure that all exceptional children in Ontario have available to them appropriate special education programs and special education services. But parents of kids who require special education still find themselves fighting every day to get supports their children need. Too often, despite the best efforts of staff, our education system fails to provide appropriate assistance that these children require. Will the minister tell parents why this government is failing to ensure all schools can meet the special education needs of Ontario students? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, 
Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, of course, we are committed to making sure that uh, special needs students all over the province are, are receiving special education services. And in fact, as uh, the, the member has noted, boards are actually required to provide special education services uh, for those who are identified. It might be interesting to note, Speaker, that actually boards uh, go beyond uh, in their provision of special education services, actually go beyond those who have been formally identified uh, and provide special education services for many students who haven't been formally identified simply because the teacher and the, 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 the principal have identified a need. In fact, our records show that about a third of the students Answer. in the province who are re receiving special education supports are doing so without formal identification because the principal recognizes the need. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the ministry has a legal obligation to ensure that special education programs and services are available to students when and where they need them. Parents shouldn't have to fight just to get the services that they're legally entitled to. And in spite of what the minister says, far too many parents continue to be told that their local school boards just don't have the resources to provide the special edu education supports their children need. Will the minister tell the House exactly how many schools are currently not able to meet their legal obligations to provide these special services? Thank you. Minister. Yes, and, and Speaker, I'm actually very pleased to report to the Legislature uh, that if you look at our special education funding, it has actually increased by $2.7 billion, or it's, uh, uh, so that, uh, it's up to $2.7 billion this year. That actually is an increase of $1 billion over it was in 2002. Uh, we've had an increase of 67 per cent since our government came into office in the amount of funding that we provide to school boards for special education. Obviously, it is up to the local school board to allocate that money to provide for needs, but uh, as, I, as I have noted here, in a Answer. time when enrollment is declining, we have increased the funding for special education by 67 per cent, by over $1 billion. Thank you. New question? The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Anybody here who remembers the tainted blood crisis of the 1980s understands the profound importance of maintaining the integrity of Canada's blood system. As a nurse and as a parent, I can really relate to this. I recall the fear of getting a letter advising that our son's already fragile health was at risk because he may have received tainted blood while hospitalized in the 1980s. Fortunately, extensive testing revealed that he did not suffer consequences of that life-saving blood transfusion. The principle of voluntary donation is one of the pillars of that system, but is being threatened in Ontario by the possibility of plasma collection sites that would pay people for their plasma. Citizens in my riding of Cambridge are also concerned about Question. this. Could the minister, through you, Speaker, inform this House of what steps he's undertaking to protect the integrity of Ontario's blood system? Thank you. Yes. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Cambridge for this timely and important question. And I was pleased uh, yesterday to stand up in this House and introduce the Safeguarding Healthcare Integrity Act uh, for its first reading. And this proposed legislation actually combines two bills that our government brought forward this past spring, one of which directly addresses the member's concerns. And these concerns have been echoed for some time by healthcare professionals and organizations, patient advocates, and ordinary Ontarians who are opposed to private for-profit plasma collection. I agree, and our government agrees, and that's why I was proud to introduce this proposed legislation. I urge all members of this House to stand together against the payment for blood or plasma donations in Ontario. This will build on steps that our government has already yes, taken to protect the integrity of our public blood donation system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, as a nurse who has been asked about the safety of our blood supply by former patients, 
I'm pleased and relieved that the minister has reintroduced this bill, and I hope that all members will support its passage. The gift of blood is the gift of life, and I know that we are all grateful to the thousands of Ontarians who voluntarily, uh, voluntarily give blood and plasma every single year. Their donations help others to survive accidents, surgeries, as well as life-threatening conditions. I've seen many patients in hospitals, as well as our own son, recover due to the generosities of these selfless citizens. Ontarians who need blood and plasma products can take comfort in the strength and the safety of our blood supply today, but they also need to know that life-giving blood and plasma Question. products will be available when they need it. Could the minister tell this House whether this legislation, if passed, might negatively impact the availability of blood thank and plasma you. products in Ontario? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Cambridge. Our government takes the supply of blood, plasma, and plasma based products very, very seriously, and this proposed legislation would not reduce that supply for Ontarians in any way. There is simply no need for a parallel private for profit blood system in Canada. The demand for plasma used in transfusions has actually been decreasing in Canada, and we are completely self sufficient in this area. For-profit clinics would likely sell their plasma that they collect for a profit on the international market to manufacture plasma products for pharmaceutical use. There's no guarantee that this plasma would even come back to Ontario. Speaker, for more than 15 years, our blood system has been ably managed by Canadian Blood Services, a public not-for-profit organization. Sir. I remain confident in their ability to manage a national blood system that meets all of Ontarians' needs. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Members from all sides of this House understand the difficulties many families have in accessing support and services for their family members living with a developmental disability. One family in Dufferin Caledon recently had a terrible experience with the local Developmental Services Office, or the DSO. This family has been looking after their child with a physical and developmental disability for over 30 years, but because the parent's own health is declining, they called the DSO to update them and ask for assistance. The reaction from the DSO was anything but helpful. They displayed an appalling lack of empathy to my constituent, going so far as to say they were lucky to receive any funding at all. Do you believe this is how DSO staff should be responding to families who have reached out to them for help? Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, in general, uh, obviously, in response to uh, the story that we have just been told, uh, I would uh, uh, be most distressed, uh, and my heart goes out to that family, uh, to have received uh, that kind of response to uh, a genuine request for help. I think we need to remember, however, that uh, DSOs are very new. Uh, in terms of their establishment by our government. Uh, they were established in 2011 for the very purpose of providing a one window so that applications by families could be made in a consistent way uh, so that uh, we could ensure that a single application uh, was made and that there was consistency across uh, the province in that way. And so we are aware that there have been some growing pains. We want to renew an emphasis on customer service as we go forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your candor. I know you understand the challenges facing this sector, and I believe you want to see improvements. But fundamental changes need to be made at the DSOs to improve their service. The Select Committee on Developmental Services made seven recommendations specifically related to improving the work of the DSOs. Not every recommendation involves spending more money, but all of them requires leadership from you. These recommendations can start making a difference immediately. Minister, will you end the wait, adopt the Select Committee's recommendations, and improve customer service at yep. DSO offices across Ontario? Here, here. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, quite clearly, we put a, a plan in place uh, outlined in the budget to invest some $810 million wow. over wow. three years. This is going to have a dramatic impact uh, on those needing developmental services. It will provide direct funding for some 21,000 people, support more than 4,200 people as they navigate key life transitions, such Order. as going to post-secondary school or getting a job. They will provide support for approximately 1,400 people with urgent residential needs. They will promote community living partnerships through expanded host family and supported independent living programs. This is uh, our plan. This is introduced not only Answer. May the 1st, but reintroduced. There's a chance at redemption for the opposition parties to stand with us and vote for the budget. Thank you. The, the uh, member from Oshawa. No. Windsor West. Windsor West. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. In late April, the government announced plans for a high-speed rail line that would run from Toronto to London. In Windsor, many of us wondered why we had been left out of the new plans since we had been included in earlier plans. Well, a couple weeks later, the election was called, and the Liberal candidate in Windsor West, who was also a cabinet minister, suddenly promised that the province would expand high-speed rail to Windsor after all. Now, with the election over, the government seems to have forgotten its promise to the people of Windsor. Once again, the government talks only of a line from Toronto to London, not to Windsor. Mr. Speaker, I would like a yes or no answer. When the government says it will open a high-speed rail line within 10 years, does this line include Windsor? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Windsor for this question. I, I don't recall if this is the first opportunity that I've had to respond to a question from this new member, but I do appreciate hearing about this issue that I know is very, very important to not only her community, but also communities like London, Kitchener, and Toronto, of course. I think it's important to recognize, Speaker, that in order for us to accomplish um, achieving uh, this kind of ambitious plan that we have for transit and for transportation, that it is important to recognize that we can only accomplish that. Uh, if we have support for the budget that's before the House this week, Speaker, uh, the $29 billion that are included for transportation and transit infrastructure are crucial to making sure that not only do we deal with high-speed rail for communities like Kitchener, like London, and potentially for Windsor as well, but it's also important to make sure that we keep the province moving forward. Part of that $29 billion, Speaker, is roughly $14 billion for communities that fall outside Answer. the GTHA. We are, in the, we are in the process, the ministry is in the process of working to complete the business case and launch the EA, Speaker. I look forward to talking to this member and others about how we can move forward with our plan to benefit her community and all other communities across southwestern Ontario. Speaker, Windsor, voted, Windsor voters were promised high-speed rail by this government, not another study. It was right there in big letters on their candidates' billboards. But clearly, the government has no intention of including Windsor in its 10-year high-speed rail plan. In fact, it's hard to believe the government is serious about high-speed rail at all. It is mentioned nowhere in the government's budget. And the government refuses to release the study that supposedly shows that it can open this line in less than 10 years from now at an unbelievable net cost of just $500 million. Will the government finally admit that high-speed high speed rail is nothing more than an empty election promise? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member from Windsor for that supplementary question. I don't want to be presumptuous, Speaker, and, and from, from my particular vantage point, talk about what the people of Windsor may, have, may, may or may not have voted for, but my guess is, Speaker, uh, the people of Windsor, like people in London and Kitchener and Toronto and my riding of Vaughan, Speaker, I'm pretty sure those people voted for the very thoughtful and ambitious plan that we have as a government that's laid out on our platform, it's laid out on our budget, the $29 billion for transit and transportation infrastructure. 
It's, it's also really important to recognize, Speaker, that the high-speed rail project, and this is a project that the Ministry of Transportation is working hard to finalize the business case for and then launch the EA and get on with that work. That project over the next 10 years, Speaker, will create tens of thousands of jobs and has the potential, Speaker, especially if we have the cooperation and the hard work uh, and the opportunity to work with members on all sides of the House, it will also help re-energize the entire southwestern Ontario Answer. economy. I call on that member to support our budget so we can get on with these Thank very you. important projects. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister uh, for Francophone Affairs, the Honourable Madeleine Meyer. Uh, on July 10th, the French Language Services Commissioner tabled his annual report. In his report, it's important, it's a first report as, as an officer of the legislature. Mr. Speaker, the minister responsible for Francophone affairs, what is the question from the government? Thank you, the minister. Thank you. I would like to thank the member for Toby Connor for his question. Our government is very proud of having tabled a bill making the commissioner an independent officer. I want to thank the opposition parties that supported the bill, in particular the member from Nepean Carton, Nickel Bell. Uh, uh, bill has four recommendations, and to this year, the Commissioner raised uh, uh, some important concerns, and we will uh, study the recommendations and we'll forward it to Im improve uh, French language services for Francophone communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs for her response, and also for how dedicated she is to the Francophone and Francophile community, as myself, I'm a Francophile, for more than 10 years. The Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs mentioned justice in French. And Mr. Speaker is for the uh, Attorney General. And the Commissioner congratulated the government for improving service in many areas, including justice. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General, can she give us uh, some uh, indication of what we have accomplished in the justice field? Thank you again for the minutes. And our government is very, wants to improve access to French language services in the justice uh, field. And the uh, Attorney General, that was my predecessor, uh, created a committee that gave some recommendations. And so those are being studied and will be implemented, and there will be development of French language services. And each year, uh, people involved in the field and in the ministry uh, meet to uh, develop what are the priorities. And this committee received uh, an honorable mention in the report by Mr. Boileau. And so we are uh, studying the feasibility of a pilot project to improve access to service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Paris, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, the village of Burks Falls, my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka, is facing a serious challenge. Since your government ended the Connecting Links program in 2013, they've had to take on the cost repairs to the Armstrong Bridge that serves as a main artery through the village. Downloading. The work needs to be done soon and has estimated cost well over a million dollars. Area residents, re seasonal residents, rely on the route to access Provincial Highway 520 that connects to the village of Magnetowan, Saseeb Lake, Omic Lake, and Provincial Highway 124. The Armstrong Bridge is a connecting link in every sense of the term. Minister, what is being done by your government to support small municipalities like Burke's Falls who now face massive infrastructure costs with the ending of the Connecting Links program? Thank you. Minister Transportation. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perry Sound Muskoka for that question. Uh, this is uh, the first opportunity that I've had uh, to hear specifically about this, uh, this, um, this let's call it unique uh, thing that's taking place in his in his riding in that particular community. And I'm happy to offer the opportunity for the member opposite to uh, have a longer conversation with me uh, about the particular issues that um, 
that are affecting this community. I think it is also interesting to note, Speaker, uh, that as we've heard since coming back to this legislature post the election from the party opposite repeatedly, uh, that they feel very compelled that the most important thing for this government to do is to cut and to slash uh, and to do everything we can to tear Ontario down. That from time to time, including today, we hear members like this member opposite stand up and ask a question on behalf of their community that calls on us to actually make investments, Speaker. I think it's interesting to see that there's a bit of a discordant note on that side of the legislature about what the most important thing is. I am happy to talk to the member offline about what's taking place in this community, but this Sir. is why, Speaker, fundamentally it's so important for us to support the investments we want to make to build all of Ontario up. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Minister of Transportation. Minister, the municipality has done their due diligence. Over the past year, they've met with regional MTO officials and have been seeking alternate avenues for funding. Berks Falls' annual tax levy is under $1 million, and they're already undertaking major upgrades on the municipal water system. They have to rebuild another bridge, the Young Street Bridge, and they have to rebuild their water tower in 2016. Councillors are worried that the unexpected cost of looking after the Armstrong Bridge will bankrupt the village. So my question, Minister, will you work with Berks Falls Council to help them with the challenge of maintaining the Armstrong Bridge? Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the supplementary. As I said in my opening answer, I'd be happy to work with that member and people in his community to do what we can. But most importantly, Speaker, it's, it's important to recognize that the budget that we've introduced in this legislature, the budget that we campaigned on that formed the basis of our election platform, makes permanent an infrastructure fund that will help alleviate the burden that many municipalities are facing. And I know that uh, colleagues on this side of the House, like the Minister of uh, of uh, Agriculture and Rural Affairs, and I probably messed up a little bit of that name, but also the Minister responsible for infrastructure will work very hard to make sure that we can make the investments in communities across the province. Of course, I'd be happy to talk to this member about what's taking place in his community, but again, I want to say, Speaker, this is why Answer. it's important for us to have a plan moving forward that invests in communities across this province, and they should support our budget for that reason, Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Minister of Health. I have a constituent, uh, Mr. Richard Gauthier, who lives in Timmins, who is, suffers from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but the only drug that he's able to take in order to give him quality of life and keep him outside of the hospital is Exelair. The problem is, at the time that he was prescribed this drug, it can only be applied and given in a clinic, and it happens to be that it's in the city of Toronto. He has been refused his travel grants. My question to you is, are you prepared to review this case in order to approve the travel grants for his treatment he was not able to get in the city of Timmins? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member opposite. I'd be happy to sit down with you and also to uh, review the case uh, uh, with my ministry officials to see uh, what is the best approach, obviously, to take in this particular case. Uh, I won't speak any more in terms of the details, but I certainly commit to uh, working with you to see if we can find a resolution to it. And, um, and it is important uh, to uh, emphasize, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, cases of uh, such as these uh, emphasize the importance of us having a drug program which is fair and equitable to all Ontarians and that we continue to invest as we do. I think over $4 billion annually is invested in our drug programs. Uh, there are particular incidents that come up from time to time. I'm happy uh, as the minister responsible to, uh, to look uh, into this case uh, personally and just ensure that, in fact, it is meeting the criteria and being handled in a fair and equitable way. Answer, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Save by a second. <laughs> I, listen, I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate that the. I appreciate that the minister is willing to look into it, but I just want to be clear. Exelair is covered by the Trillium Drug pro pro Program. He, in fact, had to go after it in order to be able to uh, after them in order to get it approved. The issue is, is that it can only be given and these particular clinics that are actually not approved clinics by the province of Ontario. There's no such clinic available in Ontario. It's all in Timmins. It's only in Timmins. It's only in Toronto. So I appreciate that you're prepared to look at it, and I look forward to a resolution to this so that he can actually have his travel grants paid. Because otherwise, we would have to pay to keep this gentleman in a hospital at a much higher cost uh, than the, ex the actual treatment would cost. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the additional details. We'll follow up directly. Thank you. A member from Scarborough Rouge River on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I hope you would allow my indulgence that uh, 
I would like to uh, recognize two of my guests that are in the West Gallery. Uh, they're longtime residents of my riding of Scarborough Rouge River and very close friends, uh, Mr. Joseph Xi'an and his wife Ying Xi'an. They're here to observe the proceedings of the legislature. The member from Bramley Gore Malton on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for your indulgence, and I ask all members of the House to join me in welcoming uh, dear friends of mine from uh, the riding, uh, Surjit Singh, as well as uh, Jaswinder Singh Badesha, uh, who forms uh, one brother of three brothers who are very uh, influential business people in the community and great supporters of mine, Harjit Singh Badesha and Harpal Singh Badesha, and as well as members of the Canadian Sikh Association. Thank you so much for welcoming them all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please join me welcoming my fourth intern, Tanvir John Muhammad, sitting at the Let members' gallery over there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, I'd ask all members to uh, help me welcome my legislative assistant, Ms. Tanya Kuzman, and Mr. Nick Bolatovich, who is an exemplary uh, young activist in Etobicoke Lakeshore and a great volunteer. Thank you. I'm sure all of you will appreciate that absolutely none of those were point of order, <laughs> but we do welcome our guests all the time. This House, uh, there are be no, being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until. 3 p.m. this afternoon. Almost forgot. <laughs> <laughs>